to the new academic building in the Sheikh Zayed Theatre and I'm delighted to be able to introduce John Gee this evening. John and I, um, our careers have sort of circled each other um, for the last uh, few years. For a while, when I was chairman of the FSA, John was my, as it were, minder uh, in the Treasury. Um, we used to deal with each other pretty regularly. Then, of course, he went off to run the Home Office, uh, and I came here, and then he went to be Deputy Governor at the Bank of England, where he occupied the office which I had had about 10 years previously. Um, John is about to step down from that position, where, of course, he has been in the eye of the storm for the last 18 months or so. Uh, and at the end of February, he's going to go off uh, and spend a few months at the Kennedy School in Harvard before I am sure he will pop up again in some distinguished office in the UK. So tonight is, uh, as it were, his swan song, uh, his reflections on the period in which he's been in a particularly challenging position as Deputy Governor for Financial Stability. And so without more ado, John Key, well. Well, thank you very much, Howard, and I'm delighted to be here. Um, this is transformation to the LSE. I've known to come and like over the years, um, so well done. Um, as you say, I'm about to leave the Bank of England. I've been there for three years. I've been the Deputy Governor responsible for the work on uh, the financial sector and financial stability and a member of the MPC. Um, in the old phrase, it's been a game of two hearts uh, for 18 months from January 2006 to July 2007, we were in the tail end of the great stability, an extraordinary period of nearly 15 years of continuous growth, low inflation, falling unemployment, um, which was guided by and reinforced a consensus among uh, economists and, and policy makers about how to manage a modern economy and a consensus that the UK was doing it pretty well. The second 18 months, of course, have seen an extraordinary reversal with turmoil in financial markets, the credit crunch, the onset of a severe global recession, calling into question nearly every aspect of that consensus. The immediate challenge, of course, is to limit the depth and duration of the recession and bring the economy back onto its sustainable path with low but positive inflation. <coughs> but we've just set out our analysis of the economic prospects, and Charlie Bean, my fellow Deputy Governor, has made a speech earlier this week on the policy choices we're now tackling. So I thought I'd spend today um, talking about some of the wider implications for the way we conduct economic and financial policy. In doing so, of course, I'm well aware we haven't got to the end of the story. Uh, we don't know how long, <coughs> indeed, this recession is going to be, and we don't know how far and how fast financial markets will recover. So it's too early to reach settled conclusions. Uh, so I'll offer this as an interim report, seven lessons which I dr I've drawn from my experience to date. Let me start there with the consensus in 2006. Um, it was based on the experience of repeated bouts of inflation and the three serious recessions which had been necessary to bring it under control. That experience hammered home the lesson that there was no trade-off between uh, growth and inflation and that the best that macro policy could do was to aim for a stable, low inflation uh, platform for sustainable growth. And the growth would be at a rate determined by the dynamism and the productivity of the economy, which could properly be addressed by microeconomics. The right instrument to maintain low inflation was monetary policy, and to ensure that interest rates were used to that end, and thus to condition expectations, decisions should be taken by an independent central bank,
pursuing an explicit inflation target and informed by modern macroeconomics. In macro terms, fiscal policy was put on autopilot. Discretionary changes in the government's tax and spending plans were thought to require too much time to agree and too much time to take effect to be useful in stabilizing the economy. And economists worried that they'd be ineffective anyway because households and companies would look through the cut in taxes today towards the compensating increase tomorrow. So fiscal policy focused on other aims, distribution, innovation, growth, and the investing in public services. Alongside that macro framework, <coughs> there was a consensus that industry and commerce was best left to the market, with market failures and externalities dealt with by independent regulators. And in the financial sector, that responsibility was given to Howard, actually, in the FSA, um, which inherited from the bank an approach to prudential supervision in particular, which was based as far as possible on principles rather than a detailed rule book. This bit of the UK system was controversial in some quarters, but when I arrived at the bank in 2006, it was definitely at the top of the best buy table. The IMF had called it a model for other countries, and a succession of central bankers and ministers appeared in London to learn from it. The chairman of the FSA was invited by the Treasury Secretary to address the leaders of all the regulators in the US. And the mayor of New York commissioned a report which concluded that if New York was to retain its leading edge, it needed to copy features of the London system of regulation. In short, the three separate authorities, each with a clear remit and the independence to pursue it, this model was seen as a good model for a modern economy. And it worked. We shouldn't underestimate the achievement of the next decade. As recently as 10 or 15 years ago, low and stable inflation still seemed an unattainable goal. But as this chart, rather complicated chart, shows, it compares volatility of inflation uh, on the vertical axis, variance of output on the uh, horizontal axis, and the inflation targeting regime, the first 12 years, is shown on the bottom left. The volatility hit new lows. And this wasn't just a UK uh, achievement. Similar gains were achieved overseas, uh, and indeed somewhat earlier in the US. In the UK, we also seemed to avoid the sort of cyclical booms in output income and employment we'd seen in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And this chart illustrates that. It shows in quarters in the quarters running up to a recession, consumption growth. And the blue <coughs> line was the 70s, the green line was the 80s, the orange line the 90s. And you will see in each case there was a marked boom before the bust. That is less obvious uh, this time around. And even with the benefit of hindsight, it's hard to demonstrate that the broader economy was running significantly above capacity in the last few years, and this is an indicator of labor market tightness. Neither the labor market nor the surveys of capacity utilization rang alarm bells. Indeed, when I arrived at the MPC in early 2006, some members were arguing that we needed to cut rates again following a year when unemployment had ticked up and house prices had appeared to achieve the mythical uh, soft landing after a relatively light touch on the interest rate trigger. Of course, there was an academic debate about whether this was luck or good judgment. But while <coughs> the expansion of China and other low-cost producers provided a helpful tailwind, the system did seem to have dealt with some big shocks 
like the East Asian crisis and the dot-com bubble. So most commentators assumed that the policy framework had played a good part. Well, clearly the last 18 months have shown that reduced volatility of output and, and inflation didn't tell the whole story. There may not have been a boom of activity in the West, but there certainly was in many emerging markets. And the rising savings from those countries depressed interest rates and risk-free interest rates in the West. That was compounded after the dot-com bubble burst by a coordinated loosening of monetary policy, which was sustained in the US. Cheap money supported an increase in leverage in the financial sector, and this illustrates that with the UK banks saying the change in leverage. And banks became increasingly dependent on wholesale sources of funding rather than a traditional deposit base. And in the real economy, we saw asset prices, particularly house prices, rise and household balance sheets become stretched. So, fast forward to the present day and the neat separation of powers and responsibilities has disappeared. The bank as monetary policy maker is beginning to explore new unconventional tools. Fiscal policy has returned as a major part of macroeconomic management as well as an essential support to the banking sector. And the bank and the treasury have been drawn ever closer into the regulation and reform of the financial sector. So the question, I suppose, is are those just temporary changes to deal with an exceptional crisis? Or are there, or were there some more structural flaws in the original design and the original consensus that underpinned it? Hence my seven lessons. And I, um, ah, let me just try and find my seven lessons. There they are. Um, let's start with number one, the limitations of private sector risk management. One weakness that's been clearly demonstrated in the last two years is the failure of banks and many other investors to appreciate price and manage risk. It wasn't that they were blind to the fact that uh, financial markets were frothy. For example, we published analyses of the vulnerabilities in the markets in 2006 and 2007 in our financial stability reviews. These highlighted the declining price of risk, the build-up of global imbalances, the growth, growing dependence of banks on wholesale funding, and the risk that structured credit markets would seize up in a downturn. When we took that message to the chief executives of banks in London, in New York, on the whole, they accepted the analysis. They agreed that a correction was bound to come. But almost to a man, and of course they were all men, they took comfort from the sophistication of their risk management systems and their hedging strategies. They were confident they could ride out the storm. Uh, but as it turned out, their systems were preparing them for a shower rather than the hurricane that arrived. And the limitations of those risk models were cruelly exposed in August 2007. One chief uh, financial officer, one of the most successful, remarked that we're seeing things that, that are 25 standard deviation moves several days in a row. Converting that into plain English, it means that the utterly impossible was happening on a daily basis. In short, the models grossly underestimated what an abnormal event truly was. Going back a slide or two, if you compare the VARs as common measure of, of, of risk that they use um, for a number of banks, post-crisis and pre-crisis, you can see that they almost double. Of course, one of the problems was they used a very short period in calibrating their models. And this chart, which I owe to my colleague Andy Haldane, illustrates what a different distribution of possibilities you get if you look at 10 years rather than 150 years. 
But I think the problem goes deeper than the choosing the right sample period. It's not just a matter of saying it was a five standard deviation event, not a 25 standard deviation event. The longer the build up, build up of imbalances went on and the larger they became, the smaller the chance that the bubble could burst without disaster. The events of August 2007 were not a boat from the blue, but the culmination of several years of developments in financial markets. So the models were flawed. But that's not the only point. Chuck Prince, the ex-chief of City, has been widely condemned for saying as long as the music's playing, you've got to get up and dance. But in a provocative way, he was stating the obvious. Firms are expected to maximize profits, and if you don't seize the opportunities, someone else will, and they might swallow you in the process. For a private sector firm, the ideal risk management system is one that does let it dance until the music stops, but still gets it to the exit quicker than its competitors. It's noticeable that the investment banks that did best in the crisis were not those who stepped clear of the markets from the start. They were those who responded most quickly and cohesively to the signs of trouble when they emerged. Now, all banks can learn from their examples, but in a competition, someone is always going to come last. And for the authorities, what matters is what damage is done to the person who comes last and what damage that does to the system. And what we saw was that even the strongest banks have nearly been brought down by failures of weak banks. So one lesson we've learned is that we can't leave risk management to the private sector. My second lesson is around crisis management. Adair Turner gave a speech recently which uh, very clearly set out a number of failings of the regulatory system on off-balance sheet exposures, on the underweighting of trading books, on wholesale funding markets. And I'm confident that those will be addressed by the G20 summit uh, in April. But we need to be aware of the dangers of over-regulation too. Some commentators seem hell-bent on moving our banks into a system of nationalized utilities. Certainly, the strength and power of international capital markets have complicated policy making, but that's not a sufficient reason for dismantling them. And nationalization, where it's been tried, has got a poor record. It may reduce the risk of shocks, but generally only at a heavy cost in misallocation of resources and usually a continuing drain on the public purse. In my view, the aim of, of the game should be to manage the system so that we can enjoy the benefits of a free market financial sector with an efficient allocation of resources, but minimize the threats to stability. And for that, we need systems which deal with crises effectively. Clearly, the collapse of securitization markets in the summer of 07, the failure of Northern Rock, revealed gaps in our, the UK, arrangements. With the benefit of hindsight, I don't think the main problem was in the handling of the initial rescue, although the tripartite's footwork may have owed more to John Sargent than Fred Astaire. But I don't think anyone believes now that the business could be saved. It was in terminal difficulties, it was right to rescue it, and it was right to protect the positives. The bigger problem was that having stepped in, the authorities found themselves hamstrung by the lack of legal powers to resolve matters quickly and efficiently. We've learned from that experience. Since then, I think we found imaginative ways of providing liquidity to the market through, for example, the special liquidity scheme and now the bank's discount window. We led the world in recapitalizing banks in the autumn. And where banks have failed, we've been able to step in and deal with them swiftly and effectively, both through private sector solutions and the use of statutory measures. I'm delighted that tomorrow, the first parts of the new Banking Act will come into force, giving the Bank of England new powers to resolve failing banks. Giving those responsibilities to the bank 
was the right choice and one that I strongly pressed for. I think they build on the bank's role as lender of last resort in crisis handling, but more generally, they provide a statutory basis for the bank's second core purpose, financial stability, which was not mentioned in the 1998 Act or indeed any other Act, and appeared something of an orphan in the bank when supervision moved to the FSA. Over the last 18 months, of course, that's changed. And in effect, the bank has become a second pair of eyes alongside the FSA in monitoring the health of the financial sector and helping to manage our way through stress. The FSA, as the regulator, is informed by a bottom-up knowledge of the position of individual institutions. The bank is informed by a top-down view, drawing on its own engagement in many markets and its analysis of the wider economy. Some argue, of course, we should go further and we should go back to a system in which the bank is responsible for prudential supervision. That would certainly be workable. We've done it before. But it's important not to underestimate the costs of transition and the new boundary issues that that would create. The culture and staffing of the bank and of the FSA have changed a great deal since 1997 and wouldn't be easy to reshape. And there are genuine advantages for firms in having a single regulator to deal with and for regulators in being able to look at the whole of a firm's business, which we might miss. My personal view is that there isn't a clearly superior arrangement to the revised structure we've now put in place. It's not clear that any country has done much better than the others, despite wide differences in regulatory regime. Perhaps Canada has the best claim, and that has a system quite similar to the UK's in many respects. One lesson I do draw, though, is that whatever the institutional boundaries, in a crisis like today's, it's vital that the regulator, the central bank, and the finance minister, ministry cooperate closely. So I'm pleased that the new legislation puts uh, a clear duty on the bank to cooperate with the FSA and the Treasury and recognizes that this is a joint objective. My third lesson is on international coordination. And if the tripartite arrangements at home needed to be refreshed, cross-border coordination needs to be transformed. The failure of Lehman's was a fully-fledged disaster for the world economy, and a number of other cases from the failure of Icelandic banks to Fortis, <coughs> Dexia, IKB, have shown how difficult it is to manage failures which cross borders. One response is to say we need a global regulator to deal with global institutions. That means pooling national sovereignty, it possibly means finding a global fiscal authority. Even the most uh, adept diplomat would quail at selling that as a package to the US and China, for example. The opposite is that multinationals like Lehman's pose too great a risk to stability and should be subject to much greater control by host authorities in each jurisdiction. But that retreat from globalization would also have a cost in inefficiency and restraint on flows of capital. We shouldn't forget that the last decade of relatively free financial markets has been a time of huge progress across the developing world in Asia, Eastern Europe, and South America. But that process of reintroducing national controls, even in the UK, the most open of economies, will continue unless we can convince ourselves that we have a better structure for cooperation and coordination in place. This is a, an acute problem for the EU, which, whose single market is based on a common passport. But dealing with the European problem isn't the main priority when most of the world's biggest banks come from outside. We shouldn't give up on this international agenda. We've shown in economic measures that we can manage coordinated action. I think 
the Financial Stability Forum package, which will be, I hope, endorsed by the G20, will show in policy we can coordinate. But we also need more progress on implementation, and particularly stronger cross-border crisis planning, a subject on which I, uh, my last act in this job is to try and sell a package to the Financial Stability Forum on that. I think the problem here is partly uh, national conflicts, but much more the sheer lack of information or time in a crisis to start ringing around the world. And we can do something about that. I hope we'll agree two things at the G20 summit. A statement of principles on how countries should cooperate in planning for and handling crises and a program to put in place specific arrangements for the largest banks in the world. Using the core colleges of supervisors, we need to create a shared database open to all the, auth the key authorities. That at least would give us the basis for considering coordinated solutions when something goes wrong. And in time, we should move forward on harmonizing the national resolution regimes. Well, so far I've been talking about finance, finance but I think the, um, the, the current recession poses a substantial challenge for the economics profession and particularly for macroeconomic modeling too. In truth, much of my critique of the models that financial institutions use to calibrate risk could equally be leveled at the workhorse DSG models that economists and central bankers tend to use to describe and forecast the economy. They've got a number of attractive features, but unfortunately also some big drawbacks. First, they tend to beg some important questions for policymakers. They assume that agents believe that the policymakers will not fail in returning uh, to their targets. Second, the models generally assume that the path of the economy is one of equilibrium disturbed only by a sequence of more or less random shocks to which it responds in short order to return to the equilibrium path. So economists who are working these models always have to put a great deal of thought into where are we starting from, which shocks are we responding to, because that will determine the path back to equilibrium. But in truth, these aren't just real events, real shocks. Some of the shocks are the limitations of the models themselves. And in particular, the models can't easily deal with self-reinforcing movements away from equilibrium. What at first glance can look like a series of unrelated disturbances to the variables in the model can actually reflect a common and continuing economic impulse. And unfortunately, the areas of the economy which the current generation of models don't cover well include the areas where imbalances have been building up in recent years and where um, uh, markets are particularly prone to self-reinforcing movements. The treatment of financial markets and their interaction with the real economy is little more than a sideshow, and banks are typically absent altogether. These features mean that the current generation models have not been good at joining up the dots in the last upswing, and they've not been good at capturing the impact of tightening credit conditions in the last few years. <coughs> now, I should emphasize that the MPC is not a slave to any one model. Mervyn, the current governor, reminds us at almost every meeting that it's vital not to confuse the real world with the model. Um, and we've used a number of different models to capture the impact of credit markets in recent years. We base our forecasts on a broad set of evidence, and most of our forecasts have a lot of added judgment in them. But we do use a, a macro model to set the baseline all such models have, are simplifications and have difficulty in identifying turning points, but we badly need some new thinking to make them better. <laughs>
putting banks into the models would be a good place to start. And uh, the banking sector model, which is being developed in the, in, in the financial stability wing of the bank at the moment, should make a good contribution to that. Um, I'm now on to lesson five, and uh, you'll be pleased to hear. Um, this is the answer to the Greenspan uh, doctrine, if you like. The fact is that for many years, banks, central banks have tended to follow similar strategies, so much so that John Taylor was able to capture most of what they did in a very simple rule. And his simple rule didn't say anything about asset prices and stock imbalances of the kind we've have, we're having to deal with at the moment. And that reflected really a default position of policymakers that interest rates shouldn't be used to choke off a boom in financial markets, which has been based on two key judgments. The first is that the costs of leaning against imbalances in financial markets were high. It was believed that policymakers would find it difficult to differentiate between justified asset price changes and bubbles. The central bank which responded to movements was likely to make a lot of mistakes. And by the time it was confident, if it held back and waited till it was confident, it would typically be too late to act. An increase in interest rates late in the day could prove counterproductive. The bubble might well have burst on its own by the time policy began to have effect. And even when you got it all right and identified a bubble in the making, the change in interest rates might be too large and might have serious side effects. Now much of this will be familiar to policymakers in all fields. It's the council of despair. Understanding how developments in financial markets um, pose risks to the system is a difficult task, but it's one we need to embrace and we can't shy away from. The final leg of that argument is a bit more serious, which is how, how much higher would interest rates have had to be to choke off the boom in financial markets. Some commentators have made much of the bank's decision to cut interest rates by 25 basis points in the summer of 2005 by a narrow majority. <coughs> But to pretend that all this could have been avoided if interest rates had been a few basis points higher over the last couple of years seems to me pure wishful thinking. Likewise, the idea that had rates been a little higher at the tail end of the boom last year and the year before, the crash would have been averted. Interest rates would have to have been significantly higher for an extended period of time, perhaps as far back as 2002, 2003. Growth would have been weaker, inflation would have undershot the target by even more than it did, sterling probably would have risen, which leaves the question, is that a price we should have been willing to pay? And that brings us to the second part of the mopping up theory, which was the policymakers believed that the costs of allowing a bubble to run its course were relatively small. Interest rates could always be cut after the event to mop up the damage. Uh, Alan Blinder and Rice summarized the received wisdom beautifully in their review of the decision in the US to loosen policy when the dot-com bubble burst. They said, if the mopping up strategy worked this well after the mega bubble burst in 2000, Shouldn't we assume that it would also work well after other, presumably small, smaller bubbles burst in future? Um, enough said, it doesn't look like that now. And I think one of the key lessons of, um, of the recent years is the mopping up strategy is a bad one. A more fundamental question is whether the inflation targeting regime itself needs to be rethought. There are those who think we've been tied into to too narrow a remit so that we can only change interest rates when there's a clear and present danger to consumer prices. And so they have, we couldn't use them to address financial imbalances. I don't think that's right. It's an unduly narrow interpretation 
of the, of the framework. As my fellow Deputy Governor Charlie Bean put it, a central bank seeking to stabilize inflation and output over a sufficiently long time horizon should necessarily aim to incorporate the possible adverse long-term consequences of an asset price bubble in its deliberations. Intelligent long-term inflation targeting on these lines run by independent central banks still seems to me the best foundation for macroeconomic policy. But that doesn't mean the current framework or the way we explain it is, is perfect. And I want to make three points on this. First, a point on communication. Inflation targeting was intended to control inflation, but not just that. It was seen as the best framework for promoting wider economic prosperity and stability. It seems to me crucial that at a time of economic hardship, with companies going to the wall and people losing their jobs, that people know that the bank is not focused on narrow, a narrow inflation target for its own sake. If they feel we're not accepting responsibility for what happens to growth and jobs, they'll look for someone else to do it. If we want to preserve the framework, we have a job on our hands to explain our strategy and convince the public that the policy we're pursuing is the best way of restoring growth and full employment without reawakening inflation. Indeed, it is by bringing output back to potential that we will bring inflation back to target. My second point is a more narrow one. I share the widely held view that setting a target for a measure of consumer price inflation which excludes the costs of home ownership has done us no favours. It's widely recognised as a flaw in the harmonised consumer price index across Europe, but it's of particular significance in the UK where home ownership plays such a critical role. I think we should remedy that situation and if progress can't be achieved at a European level, I think we ought to consider going it alone. But the third point is a bit more fundamental. I believe inflation targeting is an essential foundation of policy, but it's pretty clearly not sufficient on its own. We're now learning a lesson that Japan learned a, de a decade ago, and uh, the governor recently, of uh, the Bank of Japan recently remarked, inflation targeting works well if it's properly understood, but this can be difficult once an economy has attained and maintained a low inflation rate for a number of years. You must not overlook the insidious build-up of unsustainable balances. This is partly a matter of adopting the intelligent approach I described. We must be willing to lean against the wind of asset price booms and credit expansion and to tolerate weaker growth and lower employment in doing so. But if we need to prevent asset price and credit booms as well as control consumer prices, it would be better to have two instruments than one. And that's my final lesson. The need to develop instruments which directly dampen the cycle of credit growth and asset prices. The first step is to decide how ambitious we want to be. Um, I don't think we've got all the answers yet, but the outlines of a scheme are beginning to emerge, not least in an impressive recent report by Charles Goodhart of this parish and several friends, which, are being taken, which is being taken up vigorously, especially by the British participants in the international policy negotiations. One minimum step is to remove as far as possible the features of the regulatory system which exacerbate the cycle. This isn't as easy as it sounds. Both accounting rules and regulatory capital requirements are based on the probability of default and the estimates of loss given default, and both of those tend to rise sharply when the economy turns down. The FSA have announced in the last month some measures which seek to address that and diminish that pro-cyclicality by basing their capital requirements on average loss rates through the cycle. And a similar approach, I think, could be adopted internationally. A more ambitious goal 
would be to use the regulatory system to dampen the impact of the economic cycle on banks. In other words, to protect the banks against the cycle. And we have one of those uh, in being at the moment. The Spanish system of dynamic provisioning is an example. It's based on the observable fact that arrears and defaults tend to emerge in downturns and that loans written at the top of the cycle tend to have higher loss rates. So banks are required to set aside general provisions against likely future <coughs> losses each time they write a loan. And the provision is based on a formula which is sensitive to the point in the cycle. Moreover, this is an accounting provision. So it directly reduces profits when, when the loans are made and therefore feeds through into bonuses, dividends, and other profit-related pay. Moreover, they are drawn down automatically as losses appear. The system hasn't prevented the mother of all property booms in Spain. It can't offset the power of monetary policy in itself, but it has certainly put their banks in a much stronger position to survive it by calling on the general provisions, which I gather at the beginning of the downturn amounted to over 1% of total assets. In my view, there's a case for going one step further, though, and not just protecting the banks against the cycle, but protecting the cycle against the banks. Um, in other words, seeking to smooth out the credit cycle so that imbalances in financial markets don't destabilize the real economy. That would involve varying the regulatory requirements, requiring banks to hold more capital than they otherwise would as credit conditions ease, <coughs> and then allowing banks to run down that capital when they'd otherwise be restricting credit. This approach could offset to some degree not just the domestic credit cycle, but the impact of developments elsewhere, which can affect the terms on which banks are able to raise funds or the value of their assets. It would allow the authorities to make the banking system a shock absorber rather than a, a shock amplifier. With that aim in mind, what's the choice of in instruments? Well, firstly, I think we should adopt dynamic provisioning. In other words, we should amend our accounting systems to recognize probable future losses. It seems to me that that produces a better guide to the real financial strength of banks and is properly conservative in not recognizing profits before they're earned. However, I'm aware that it runs counter to a powerful school of accounting theology. Um, still, I've been encouraged by proposals circulated recently uh, by Paul Boyle at the FRC, for example, and I hope that this accounting change will be pursued. An alternative would be to vary regulatory requirements with the cycle. <coughs> this is second best because the reserves are taken after the profit is struck with all the signals that they send to investors and staff but it could have much the same effect and might be capable of implementation a little earlier. But capital requirements aren't the only, only approach. You could have counter-cyclical limits on liquidity. These banks could be required to invest a varying proportion of their assets in gilts and other highly liquid assets, or could face varying constraints on how far they could tap wholesale markets. Finally, of course, we could reintroduce restraints on the terms on which banks can lend money to households and companies, loan-to-value limits, for example. This has obvious microeconomic disadvantages, but the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, for example, showed how such an approach could work uh, when their property market threatened to overheat in the 90s. My position is that counter-cyclical capital requirements or provisions are a large part of the answer, but I'd be inclined to keep a number of other options open too. Having a larger arsenal of policy instruments, which vary in their point of influence, would provide some welcome flexibility and allow us to respond to the particular situations. <coughs>
course, that leads on to the issue of who should have control over their policy instruments. I think the answer depends very much on the objective of policy and the way in which policy is set. Clearly, the application is up to the regulator. And if the policy has the narrower goal, and it proves possible to set clear rules in place, for example, a simple leverage ratio, there's no need for anyone else to be involved. However, if policy is given the wider macroeconomic goal of stabilizing the credit cycle and requires judgment to be made as to where we are in the cycle, then uh, I think it would be essential for central banks to play a leading role, albeit in close consultation with the regulator. And that seems to me the more likely outcome. Well, to conclude, one theme you may have noticed in these reflections is the need for policymakers to be willing to back their judgments, whether in identifying asset bubbles or identifying firms or markets which threaten financial stability, and to take preemptive action. For example, if most macro models were not giving us warning signals in recent years, our analysis of the financial sector certainly was. As I mentioned, our financial stability reports did set out <coughs> the dangers in 2006 and 2007 and indeed earlier than that. One of the lessons we have already acted on is that we need to make much more of those warnings. We now send those reports to every board member of British Bank, to the rating agencies, to the banking analysts, and we're more forthright in talking to the press in order to try and change the atmosphere in markets. But more broadly, we mustn't let a proper starting assumption that markets should be allowed to work unless there are good reasons for intervention, to become a belief that markets shouldn't be touched unless their failure and the effectiveness of intervention is proved beyond all reasonable doubt. There are risks that interventions will prove with hindsight to be costly or unnecessary, but the economy is not an area, to paraphrase Blackstone, where it's better for 10 guilty markets to escape than for one innocent to suffer. As Alan Greenspan recently observed to Congress, rather than assuming that the system is capable of Thank you very much, John. And um, we do have uh, 15 minutes or so for questions, so I'd be happy to take them. And there are microphones. And Henry, when there, um, if you could up the, how should I describe you? I think I'm allowed to say you're bald, Henry, because that's, there you are. Excellent. Got him. Yes. Um, now, we've had, over the years, a number of failures of regulation. We've had endowment mortgage scandal, the split capital scandal, the equitable life scandal. Now we have subprime mortgages, Madoff, Stanford, HBOS, RBS. Shouldn't we really, shouldn't we really be examining what the OECD say? Uh, difficult, because your failures become apparent and your successes don't. It's just waiting for one disaster after another. But regulators do need, and the authorities generally do need, to learn lessons from that through inquiring into what went, go what went wrong. I think the FSA did that in a very open way after the failure of Northern Rock. They published a report which I thought was pretty much no holds barred, and they put in place some changes. Is that the end of the matter? No, I don't think Adair or Hector would pretend it is. Uh, there are lots more lessons. Um, uh, but no regulatory system is ever going to be proof against all, um, all, all disasters or all frauds. Yeah, man in white shirt. Are you coming down with the microphone? White shirt, fourth row. Further? That's it. Hi. A lot of the uh, solutions that you uh, suggest going forward, uh, they involve counter-cyclical proposals, for instance, to do with the, uh, the capital requirements for banks. Given that the uh, government and the Treasury had to abandon its golden rules at the first recession, uh, do we still have faith in the ability of, of the government and the economy to guess where in the cycle it is? Um, well, I think 
is this is an international problem and it was an international uh, development that gave rise to it. Um, so I, I think it is difficult to know exactly where you are in the cycle and uh, you'll make mistakes on that but I think it's better to be approximately right than you know, accurate. Maybe the overheating in the capital and equity market should have been, they should have been taken into consideration between 2003 and 2008. I know that's the benefit of hindsight, but obviously comes back to the point you made about modelling. And you yourself have voted more often in the last 18 months than most of your colleagues uh, to cut interest rates, which suggests perhaps you're slightly ahead of the curve. Uh, and the second point is in terms of international coordination, isn't the most pressing thing uh, to stop the banks internationally hoarding capital. And what we need is a worldwide shift in uh, the measurement of bank capital requirements. And really, that's a point that needs to be internationally agreed as soon as possible, perhaps at the G20 and April 2nd. Well, there's a lot in there. You know, I accept the flattery. Um